recording. All right. So pipelining. So the, fir the first thing to do really when you're going to start talking about pipelining uh, is look at what exactly a normal CPU is going to do uh, with any sort of instruction. And so uh, typically you can just think of a CPU, at least from the perspective of what a pipeline does, you can just think of it as a combinational circuits, right? So we're going to have some sort of input and we have so, so the input here is going to be one instruction, right? And the CPU will perform the instruction, and then it's done with the instruction, right? So, with this model, what we what we have is well, we can have this. We'll have the CPU, and then we'll have time, right? So this is going to be some sort of time, right? So we might have instruction one would go here, and then maybe instruction two would come right after, and it'd be a bit faster, and then instruction three would happen. And then instruction four would happen, and so on. Then instruction five, right? So each instruction just gets sequentially computed, one after the other, and like instruction one has to fully complete before instruction two can start, and then instruction two has to fully finish before instruction three can start, and so on. And so it's you're not going to be using like all of the CPU all at the same time, right? Like for, for instance, if you just have a basic CPU model where you have the registers and then you have an ALU, right? You're gonna take values out of the register, process them through the ALU, and then take the result of the ALU back here, right? Well, one one part of the CPU action is gonna be read an instruction from the register. Once you do that, well then you'll process it with the ALU. And then once you're done with that, you'll write to a register, right? So at any point in time, you're only, you're either reading from a register, processing in the ALU or writing to a register, at least just using this basic model. Uh, and, and in that's sort of wasting space, right? What if you could be always every single cycle reading from a register, processing in the ALU and writing to a register every single time, every single cycle? versus one cycle being doing all of these things. And uh, pipelining is one of the methods of trying to tackle this issue, uh, of trying to saturate the hardware as much as possible. And so uh, the idea is that we can start breaking apart handling instructions into multiple stages. And then we can have multiple instructions in different stages at a time. So rather than just our model being uh, we take some instruction, we pass it into the CPU, it does the instruction, and then it's done, right? What we can instead do is maybe have two subunits. So I'll call this unit one and then unit two. Uh, Jacob, are you actually showing something right now? Uh, it should. Oh, I don't have it live. <laughs> What? <laughs> I, I, I started recording, but I never made it live. All right, well, uh, yeah, so so basically all I was explaining, you know, you have the CPU, instruction comes in, instruction goes out, and then uh, if you have one instruction, it'll pro the CPU will process that instruction, and then the second instruction, the CPU will process it, and the third instruction, and fourth, and so on. It just kind of goes linearly over time. Uh, well, what you can start doing instead is break apart the CPU into several stages or, or units, right? So let's say we break this CPU down, and so it'll do this stage and then this stage. Maybe this stage here is reading values from the register, and then this stage over here is process it in the ALU and write it back to a register, right? So we have the instruction coming in, it gets processed here, then it gets processed here, and then it's done. Well, if we start looking over time, so we have unit one and then unit two. So, so here I'll, I'll we'll model upwards as being progressing through units, and then we'll again model horizontal by time, right? Well, we might start off here. Well, instruction one is going to start off in unit one, and then once it's done, it'll go ahead and in unit one, it'll go ahead and move on to unit two. Or sorry, this will be instruction one again. All right. Well, right here. We're not using unit one anymore. So why don't we go ahead and start using executing instruction two? 
Well, then when it's it, it's done, it'll go ahead and move on to unit two as well. And then, well, again, unit one's not being used, so we can start instruction three. And we can see how at now what we're doing is we're overlapping some of our execution between different instructions. And so uh, rather than having to wait for the instruction to fully finish, we can actually use multiple parts of the CPU at the same time uh, on different instructions. Obviously, we couldn't use them at the same time for the same instruction because we do have to sequentially process that instruction, right? It's, it's impossible to simultaneously read from the registers, process those values in the ALU, and write them. That has to happen in that order. Um, but we can have one instruction reading, one instruction processing, and then one instruction writing. Uh, and in reality, the amount of units that you can break these instructions down into uh, is countless. You, you can do it as many times as makes sense for however your CPU is defined. For instance, we could start with just providing an address for an instruction, right? Uh, and, and typically that is how uh, the CPU starts, is it just has an address for an instruction to execute, right? So well, the first thing that it needs to do is instruction fetch. So fetch the, fetch the instruction from the main memory. Well, now what it, ha what it has to do is it has to decode that instruction. So instruction decode, uh, meaning, okay, well, I have some binary number that represents an action in the CPU. Well, now how do we perform that action? Uh, or perhaps, you know, these instructions are higher level instructions, um, part of what's known as a, as a CISC instruction set, complex instruction set computer, uh, where these instructions might actually have to break down into multiple smaller instructions inside of the CPU. So, so this stage right here might also like break down co more complex instructions into a set of uh, simpler instructions. And this modern computers do this all the time. Uh, then you have these instructions. So then you can start, okay, well, maybe I have a unit that can, uh, like a load unit that will that can take something from the memory and put it into a register. And then if it needs to, it'll do an ALU operation, like a register to register operation in the ALU. And then finally, there might be a unit to store something back in the main memory, right? And so each instruction will do each of these. And then after this, there might be a, a branching unit. So, so if there's any sort of conditional statement, that'll be handled here. And, and the, the list goes on. You, you, uh, it, it's literally only restricted by your imagination how many units you can break these down. Uh, if I recall, I believe Intel at some point, uh, I think back some 20 years or so, uh, they were up to, I think, a 30-stage pipeline where uh, a program would start running and then each instruction would go through one of 30 different stages before it would finally get executed. At this point, I think they're down to about 13 stages. Um, which dealing with like reordering instructions if they need to, translating higher level to the lower level. In any case, the number of stages is purely defined by the architecture that you're dealing with and by whoever or whatever team designed uh, the architecture. There isn't some specific way in which these uh, a single instruction needs to be processed. Uh, there aren't a particular set of units which are standardized. It's all entirely dependent on how it's it's made. And so uh, what really we're doing in this class is we're just saying, okay, given one of these systems, just a high level understanding of it, how might, would an instruction get processed? And so there's a, there's a couple of things that you really need to understand. Uh, there's a sort of different types of pipelining. Uh, and really it's just, features the pipelining the pipeline might actually have uh, one can be that oh well if I don't need to use the load maybe I can skip directly from the instruction decode unit to the ALU unit if it's free um, but typically the, the the most basic one is that every single instruction has to visit every unit and that's it if it doesn't need to use it well then fine it, it doesn't have to use it uh, but it still has to sort of pass through and potentially do something in that unit. And so here, um, let's say this was our pipeline here. We have a six stage pipeline. So we have, again, the first stage is IF and then ID and then LD, then ALU, then store and branch. 
And again, they get processed in this order. And then we have again our time scale. Uh, so suppose each of these units here uh, takes a hundred nanoseconds, and you know this is just an arbitrary number uh, to represent. So that means that okay, well we'd start off with our instruction, instruction number one, and that would this this time mark right here would be a hundred nanoseconds. And then we'd start on instruction two. That, that will that then instruction one move on to the unit uh, the next unit. But at the same time, we could start on instruction two, and this would be uh, two hundred. Uh, and then we could keep going, keep going. So again, so initially. It, at, at time zero here, no, no instruction to be processed. Then we start. So instructions one is going to be in this first unit here. Well, then 100 nanoseconds later, it'll be in the next unit. So from uh, times 100 nanoseconds to 200 nanoseconds, it'll be in the instruction decode unit. And then it'll go to the load unit, and then so on and so forth. So, so typically an instruction, when it's getting processed, it's going to sort of move in this direction as it goes from one unit to the next. Yeah, so, so here we can go ahead and model it going through each of the units. And if I just crudely draw that out, well, we can see that over here, from start to finish, uh, one instruction will take 600 nanoseconds. So that makes sense, right? Because there's six units. And if we just assume for uh, the, the most basic pipelining model that it'll have to go through every single unit, well, then each instruction will take uh, 600 nanoseconds. So one uh, instruction is 600 nanoseconds. Well, that's not really, well, th that is an important value, um, but at the same time, we have another value here, right? Because the, the way that this, this is set up, this pipeline here is set up, we can start a new instruction every 100 nanosecond, right? Because once instruction one moves on to the next unit, that unit gets freed and it'll, one instruction moves on to the next unit every 100 nanoseconds. So at the same time, uh, one instruction sort of takes 100 nanoseconds, right? Because we can start a new one every 100 nanoseconds. So which of these two values is really used to describe the speed? And the answer to that is both, uh, but they have different names. So here, 600 nanoseconds is referred to the latency. And the latency is essentially what is the amount of time between starting an instruction and finishing an instruction, right? How long do I have to wait if I just ex start executing instruction until I can actually get the result? The other one, 100 nanoseconds in this situation, this is known as the throughput. And this basically is the amount of time it takes to start processing a new instruction. And at the same time, it's the amount of time that it would take uh, to receive the result of different instructions, right? So, so again, here we would have two, then two, then two, then two. And although, you know, naively, you might say, okay, well, if one instruction takes 600 nanoseconds, then two instructions would take 1200 nanoseconds. But we can see here that if, if we can start instruction two back to back, that it would actually only take 700 nanoseconds to do two instructions. And so with this pipeline here, uh, and with any pipeline, if you know uh, the latency and throughput, throughput here, uh, of each instruction, there is sort of a formula for computing uh, the n amount of time that it would take to execute a particular instruction. Now, keep in mind, this, this is a super rudimentary view, typically, uh, the throughput and latency may change between instructions, but if it's constant, then you can just figure out the time, and it's it's just going to be the latency plus n minus one, n being the number of instructions you're executing, times the throughput. Right. So, like, if you're only executing one instruction, well, the latency is the only thing that comes into play, right? Because uh, it just matters when you start to end. But for every successive instruction, 
you'll get it the result, or you can start the next instruction every single instance of the, the throughput time. And so let's say with this pipeline here, we're executing a uh, hundred instructions, right? So the latency here would be 600 plus 99 times 100 nanoseconds, which is going to give a total of, let's see here, 1,500 nanoseconds. Well, suppose we could build a CPU that can do these same instructions, but it can execute j just a single non-pipeline CPU, like one something like this, where each instruction takes 500 nanoseconds, right? Whenever you break things up into stages, you're typically going, it's typically going to take longer to execute a single instruction because you're going to have to somehow synchronize everything. You're going to have to add extra components in order to get the pipeline to actually work. And so it's, it's unrealistic to think that it'll take the same amount of time uh, for a pipeline CPU to execute one instruction as it would for a non-pipeline CPU. So let, let's say, for instance, that the non-pipeline CPU would be able to execute uh, an instruction every 500 nanoseconds. Well, on a non-pipeline CPU, it's just gonna be n times that time, right? So to execute 100 instructions, we're talking about 50,000 nanoseconds versus in a pipeline CPU, 10,500 nanoseconds. So th this is the main, this is sort of mathematically showing you how a pipeline can be beneficial and, and is usually beneficial. And you can usually get a sort of scaling that is almost directly proportional to the number of units that you have, right? So so here we have six units versus one unit uh, in, a, in just a normal uh, non-pipeline CPU. And we have about a five time speed increase, uh, which is ridiculous in terms of computing you know to, to, to get a five times speed increase in most cases you'd have to do a lot of work um, but with pipelining it just sort of happens and it's uh, it's it's really really useful so uh, any questions about any of this stuff before I go on to actually like looking at questions all good all right so yeah, so now we can actually start looking at individual problems, and I'll basically try to just phrase them uh, in this case. And I haven't covered the biggest aspect of pipelining, which is hazards, but we'll get to that when we look, actually look at problems. So let's see here. All right, so uh, this first problem here uh, states that a, so a microprocessor has two internal units, uh, an instruction fetch unit uh, and an instruction execute unit. So th this would be essentially one of the most basic uh, sort of pipelines that you could do. And it's probably one of the first pipelines that was actually created. You have one unit that will take the address of the instruction being executed, fetch it from the main memory and decode it. And then you have the other one, which it, it will actually execute that operation on the CPU, right? And that's actually a really, really efficient pipeline, uh, mainly because there's usually no problem with doing uh, the instruction fetch of one instruction while you're executing another, that there's almost never an issue with that. And so this pipeline is, is actually fairly efficient uh, for just being two units. And so this is saying, uh, this is again, this is just assuming a really basic model that every single unit is going to be used by every single instruction. And it's saying here that the amount of time for the instruction fetch unit uh, is the same as the number the amount of time for the execute unit, which is 100 nanoseconds, right? And so the question would be, how much time does it take to execute five instructions? Okay, well, the basic way to go about look, solving these problems is to look at one of these tables uh, for the amount of time that things are taking. And so again, go ahead and do the vertical axis. You have the instruction fetch and instruction execute units. And again, sort of as you go up 
is what I'm representing going through the different stages. And then vertically, we have time. Right? So here we have, and I'll go ahead and draw a line here. I think, yeah, I should be able to do that. Let's make things much cleaner. Okay, so we first have. Well, instruction one is going to start in the instruction fetch unit. Then it'll move on to the instruction execute unit. And usually as I'm working through these, what I'll do is I'll mark uh, the times as I'm going along. You might think you could just make a whole set of boxes and just say, okay, well, each of these uh, times is 100 nanoseconds. Uh, but in reality, it's although it would be easy to create a pipeline in which every stage takes the same amount of time, uh, in reality, it's more dynamic than that. Uh, sometimes it'll be way faster to execute some units. And if all of the uh, units are done executing something, it, there's not really any point in waiting for like 100 nanoseconds to pass. You could start on the next cycle immediately. And so it's usually a, a bad idea to just start drawing out all the boxes uh, before you know what's going to happen. In this case, it would have been fine because everything's 100 nanoseconds and all instructions use all units. Uh, but that's just something to look out for. It's usually not a good idea to just go straight out and draw everything. So then instruction two would start immediately after instruction one is done with the instruction fetch. And then it would move on to the instruction execute the next time. And so this would be 200 and then 300 nanoseconds, and then three would be here and here. Uh, and then if we just continue the pattern, we'll see that we just keep getting instruction four would start here and then finish here, and then five would start here, finish here. And the total amount of time that it would take would be 600 nanoseconds. And so just for as a basic problem, you're just going to use this table to model uh, how the instructions are going to be passing through the pipeline at any given moment in time. And so I could say, okay, what, what's happening at time uh, 350 nanoseconds? Well, you can just take a look right here and say, okay, well, instruction three is about halfway done executing uh, the instruction execute phase. And instruction four is about halfway through executing the instruction fetch phase, phase or something like that. Uh, any questions on this before I move on? Nope. All right, well then we'll look at part B. Uh, so this was actually part A of question one. Uh, then we have part B, which is uh, essentially the same problem. We have that the instruction fetch unit takes 100 nanoseconds, but now uh, the instruction execute phase will take a variable amount of time. And here, we've actually just been given the time for each instruction. So the first one, uh, instruction number one will take 50 nanoseconds in the execute stage, then 75, and then 100, or sorry, then 125, then 100, and then finally 75. And so again, to tackle this, go ahead and draw out our timeline for the events. And we have the instruction fetch unit and then the instruction execute unit. Start at time zero. So we'll go ahead and start instruction one. So uh, instruction one will start here. And then at this point, that'll be 100 nanoseconds in. Then it'll go ahead and move on to the execute unit, um, at which point it'll only take 50 nanoseconds. So instruction one will be here and it'll be working for 50 nanoseconds while instruction two gets started. And this right here will be 200 nanoseconds. So let me just explain uh, a little bit about what's going on here. So instruction one's going to start. And while instruction one is starting, obviously we can't be executing anything because we have no other instructions to execute. We're sort of assuming that this is the first instruction the CPU is e executing. Um, okay, well, then it'll start executing instruction one while it also starts fetching instruction two. But the thing is that instruction one is going to finish in half the amount of time that it takes to fetch instruction two. And so we have this sort of hole here that just 
gets lost, right? It'll just be waiting. Now, we can't start executing instruction two in that time because it's not finished fetching. We have to fully finish fetching before we can start executing. And so we have nothing to do there. And so it just, a bubble occurs. All right. So we can go ahead and move on. So then instruction two is going to move up here. And it, it takes a little bit longer than the last one. It takes 75 nanoseconds. Um, while instruction three starts here, which is still going to take the whole 100 nanoseconds. And so this right here is at time 300. And again, we have this sort of bubble that occurs because we can't be doing anything because we have nothing else we can possibly do. And the next one is where it sorts starts to get a little bit interesting, a little bit different. So just for starters, we're going to start instruction four. However, if you notice, instruction three takes 125 nanoseconds up here to finish executing. So this would be time 400. And then this right here would be time 425 nanoseconds when it stops. And well, this is an issue, right? Uh, so before we didn't have anything that we could be doing while we were waiting. Whereas here, you might think that we could start ex executing instruction number five. However, the problem is, if you look at this timestamp right here, and, and then four would start up here, right? If you look at this sort of span of time right here, we actually see three different instructions going on and being managed at the same time, even though we only have two pipelines. And the question you have to ask yourself is, does that make any sense, right? We only have two stages, so how are we processing three instructions at the same time? Uh, and the answer is that we can't do that. It's not possible. And so at any, what we would actually have to do here is we'd have to wait for the instruction fetch unit to finish. If we don't do this, then we're going to start processing a new instruction. And then magically, we have to keep track of more instructions than we have stages. And in theory, you know, if, if the execute unit keeps taking longer and longer to execute, like let's say all the next instructions take 125 nanoseconds, then in theory, we could start fetching like four instructions while we're only executing one. And then we have to keep track of five and then six and then seven, eight, nine, ten, an infinite number of instructions. And so typically what you have to do is at some point in time, all the units are going to start doing something if they have something that they can do. And then you have to wait until all of the units are done before any of the units can start something new. And the reason for this is because otherwise you, you are processing too much information. Typically the way that pipelines work is you'll have a unit and then you'll have a set of registers or, or just a, a single register and then you'll have a unit so you have a unit and then register then unit and then register and so what happens is that the unit will execute something and then once it's done executing it'll store whatever information it needs in a register and that'll be one cycle and then the next cycle will start it'll send that information to the next unit that'll be processed and then those that result will be stored into a register and so it's possible to synchronize how everything happens with these stages. Well, it w it's not really possible to start de like you start instruction three in this unit, store it in a register, and then press it into this unit. And then while it's processing, we do four, and then we also start five. So that means like unit five and four, like instructions or in yeah instructions four and five would both have to be stored in the set of registers, and that's just not possible. Uh, it goes to say that this is assuming a more basic model of pipelining. Uh, and for the purposes of this class, this is always true. We're, all, we're not going to get too complicated in pipelining. Uh, but in modern computers, the way that pipelines work are far more dynamic. And that sort of stuff can happen, uh, though it doesn't get r run away. But for the purposes of this class, uh, we're, you just assume that that's not going to happen. We're only, only ever going to process a limited number of instructions at the same time. Uh, and so let me go ahead... I guess I can't back up. Okay. So go ahead and remove this line. Okay, so now we're at a new timestamp, right? 425, everything is done processing. So then we can go ahead and start the next sta stage of whatever we're doing. So instruction four is gonna move on here and it's gonna take 100 nanoseconds. 
And at the same time, we can go ahead and start processing instruction number five, which again, in the instruction fetch unit, it's gonna take 100 nanoseconds. So that's fine, that'll align nicely. Um, and so this timestamp is 100, uh, 425, so 100 nanoseconds later, that'll be 525 right here. Okay, then instruction five is going to move on and it's going to only take uh, 75 nanoseconds. Uh, whereas, oh, and that's it, right? So, and so once instruction five is done, um, that'll be the end of the program, right? And that's 75 nanoseconds later, so that is 600 nanoseconds right here. And so we see that we, we end up with these bubbles here. Um, but at any given time, you know, we're only ever going to be considering or processing however many instructions uh, there are. The number of stages in the pipeline is the number of instructions we can process or, or be like considering at the same time. Uh, that can be the units. So any questions on this? Uh, yes. So like in the solution, uh, while we're going through in the class, for those bubbles, like he was using a uh, small letter X. Yeah. And there was an excess. I think he was using big letter X. Um, so, um, and like in some points, like when, you know, the instruction fetch has gone from like from five uh, and then uh, the execution starts at the same time with the five, there are like lines going through, like it, he divides it with the four. Yeah, that's so I'm doing that dynamically just by writing out the timestamps and the and the bars at the same time. Uh, what his solution does is he does just have a set number of boxes. So all he has is he says, OK, this box here is 50 nanoseconds. So this would be 50 and then it would go to 100 and then. 150 and so on and so instruction one takes when it, in the fetch it starts down here in the uh, the if unit or the ie instruction execute well it starts here well it takes 100 nanoseconds so instruction one will be in this unit for those two like blocks of time and then it'll start up here while two is starting down here but one in the one only takes 50 nanoseconds in the instruction execute unit and so this timestamp here would be completely blocked off but two would still take uh 100 nanoseconds here and then we can keep going and so that's that's all uh his diagram is doing is it's just rather than um thinking oh well it's going to take I, I just dynamically drawing the boxes and labeling as you go along uh you can do it just with fixed boxes explaining what happens in, in each box. And so right here, uh, instruction two in the execute unit takes 75. Well, that's, again, each of these lines here is 50 nanoseconds. Well, to represent 75, we sort of have to break this one apart into two. So this would still be two, but this one right here would no longer be doing anything. But you can see here that that's exactly the same thing that's going on here uh, if you just label all the times accurately. So this is still going to be uh, 275. This time, this line right here is still at 150, right? So does that answer the, the question? Uh, yes. Okay. But if it, in terms of the test, will both ways work or should we do it the second way you showed? Well, typically uh, on a test, uh, this is how you would do it. Um, it makes the most sense and it's the easiest to keep track of because other, like you don't have to worry about di dividing, subdividing the boxes that are already there. Uh, but given that everything's going online and everything's online, uh, I'm not entirely sure what the best way is, or how the test is going to even happen. I don't like I don't know if uh, you're gonna like download it, write your answers and then submit it or whatever. Um, if you're having, if you have to like write, do it in text or something, then this method is probably going to be easier, because then you can just like create a table, and then if you need to subdivide, then it shouldn't be too difficult to you know write two and then a pipe and then an X. But uh, if you're able to actually write out everything, I think this one does a much better job at uh, not having too much information on the actual diagram. So here you can easily see okay well i've marked each of my time st timestamps at a certain time uh and you don't have end up with weird things like you can see at the end 
uh, of this 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 solution here. If you look at the the document where you know everything is offset and it's not in the boxes themselves. Anything else? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And could you please just complete the table real quick for the second one? Uh, I just want to see how we're going to come up to that. X yeah. Spot. Yeah, I can go ahead and do that. Okay, so about here. So here I'm just drawing out all of my 50 nanosecond boxes. So that's 300 and then three, or 350 and 400, 450, 500, 550. Need one more because it ends at 600. And 600. Okay. Uh, so now I'm just going to reference this up here. So I have instruction three starts here, keeps going here. And then now here. Uh, let's see, I'll draw the line like here in the actual, I can see in the, uh, in the solution. Well, I guess it is 25, so it does split right in the middle. That's true. Okay. So oh, let me make that straight. Okay. So three would execute for the first 25 and then four would start immediately after, you know, same thing going on here. This line right here then corresponds to that line right there while four is executing here and here. Uh, though at this point here, now this bottom one needs to be subdivided because nothing is happening here. And so then instruction five would start, it would execute for 25 and then it would continue for another 50. So that's 75. And then it would finally come here and execute for the first half of this one. At the same time that four is also executing for a hundred. So that'll be that. Um, and then finally, Instruction number five can finish executing. So it'll do 25 nanoseconds here and then uh, the other 50 here. So yeah, so uh, this line right here corresponds with this one. This line right here corresponds to this one. This line corresponds to this one. This line to this one over here. I'm not trying this well. That one uh, and then the 525 corresponds to this one here and then you've got the final 600 corresponds to that one uh, yeah and that's pretty much why I typically prefer the top one is because here you see how there's just so many more subdivisions uh, and yeah it makes it maybe a little bit harder to actually understand what's going on any other questions yeah because like um you know, here uh, we at some point put X, so we're not using that uh, spot. Mm -hmm. uh, but like in after the third third uh, instruction, we right away start with the four. Like, mm -hmm. is will uh, will it be fine if we you know put an X over there? So we... you're talking about like an X right here. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, that would not be fine. So let me go ahead and pull up a color swatch so I can change some colors. So. I'm going to draw some red lines here. It's not a great red. Let's do a little bit brighter. So if I draw a line here, a line here, a line here, a line here, and a line here. So these are the like the important subdivisions of the pipeline. And, and these correspond to this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here and this one here. And so you can notice here at the start, whenever I hit a, and I, I suppose as well that you've got one at the beginning. So whenever you hit a red line here, all every unit, if it has something that it can start doing, will start doing that thing. So here at the beginning, at, at this first time frame, uh, this instruction would start here and this instruction, there would be, no, there's nothing to execute. So that happens. Once all of the units are done, a new red bar would appears. And when a re new red bar appears, 
then you can start doing something in all of the units. So then I can start executing instruction one and fetching instruction two. But I have to wait for both of them to finish to draw another red line. And again, whenever I draw a red line, I can then start doing something everywhere. You can notice over here that the red line here is, is right here, meaning because I started right here at this red line, I started executing instruction three and fetching instruction four. And once they both finished, I then immediately start doing something else on the two units, if I can, if there is something for me to do. Like right here, I don't have anything to fetch. So if you would have put any sort of delay here, any extra delay, like an X or something, then what you're saying is, okay, for some amount of time, the CPU is going to do absolutely nothing. And it's just going to sit there not doing anything, which is just a waste of time. And so if you did put a gap there, you would end up predicting a longer execution time than what would actually happen. Uh, and so that would be bad, uh, considering the purpose of these questions is to figure out the exact precise uh, amount of execution time. Does that, answer, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Anything else about this before I go on to question number two? No, thank you. All right. So just keep moving down. Instruction number two here. So it has, now we're dealing with five units IF. ID, OF, EX, and ST. Now, uh, and then we're assuming here that IF, OF, and ST deal with memory. Have, have to do some sort of memory access. Whether that's a write or a read, uh, there's typically no distinction made between uh, a read or a write to the memory to the memory um, because typically all transactions with the memory are done through the same bus it's just sometimes it's in one direction versus the other so sometimes you're writing on that bus sometimes you're reading on that bus uh, you'll learn a bit more about that uh, later in the semester but yeah so, so it, it doesn't matter whether it's writing or reading you just need to know that it actually uses the memory um, and so also with two uh, we can now assume that if an instruction does not require a unit, it can move on to the next unit. Uh, and what that means is we now have uh, like forwarding, what, what's what's some, sometimes called forwarding. And what that means is that, you know, if I'm at the instruction decode unit and the instruction does not need either the operate and fetch or the execute, it can just skip straight to the, the, the store unit as long as there's nothing in the way. Uh, so, so uh, it it you can't jump over different instructions. However, you can move ahead if it would be faster to do so. And it, it with this problem, there's an example of uh, that happening. Uh, so for this, it's just assuming that each of the instructions takes the same amount of time, uh, just to make things easy. And then we have our seven instructions that we're executing. So we have a load uh, R1. Well, let's see here. Yeah, so R1 and then 100, R0. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just take a screenshot of that and paste it in. Alrighty here. Go ahead and move that up here. Okay. So, uh, and we also additionally have another table. I should probably go ahead and bring that. Uh, and this table here uh, gives you information about which instructions or what type of instructions use what units and this is extremely important uh, for actually getting actually understanding what instructions do what because uh, as I was talking about earlier uh, pipeline stages are essentially arbitrary 
you know, you can give them names and you can say that they do this, but you really need to understand the specific the specifics of the defined behavior in order to be actu- uh, in order to actually be able to know what units an instruction needs. And so typically uh, you should be given this sort of table because it'll tell you exactly what type of instruction uses what uh, registers. And I can see here uh, that there is one type of instruction that is missing, particularly for this add R1 and R2. And for that, so if I have an add slash sub register to register, I'm going to assume that I have to fetch the instruction, decode the instruction. I don't have to do an operand fetch. I can then execute an operation store. So same sort of thing as a load register to register, but just with an add instead. So just, yeah, it'll sometimes you have to do some interpretation. Um, but if you're given this sort of table, sometimes it's possible. Uh, with this case, these units stand for instruction fetch, instruction decode, operand fetch, uh, execute, and then store. And so this right here will fetch something from the memory. This here will actually execute like a register to register operation. And then this would actually store something back to the memory if needed. Okay, well, we have all of the information now. So we can go ahead and start with the table. And so for this one here, uh, and specifically, I guess for this, uh, we're completely ignoring any sort of data dependencies. Uh, which is typically vital to consider, but we'll we'll get to that later. Um, so we have our units. We have if, id, of, ex, and then st. And so like on a test or something, uh, if you have access to paper, you can obviously just draw this out. Uh, and typically, you can always draw this out, right? I, I would not recommend drawing horizontal lines, or sorry, vertical lines, unless you know that there is some sort of specific time that everything will happen at. Um, like in this problem, everything's 100 nanoseconds, so I can go ahead and draw uh, vertical lines because I know that each of these lines is just represent 100 and I don't, I never have to subdivide them. But otherwise, just draw the vertical ones and then draw the horizontal ones later when you know what time something occurs at. Let's have a little bit of leeway to work here. I can actually see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and I'll go ahead and draw an 11th one just to be safe. So each of these is 100. So 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. All right. So we have our first instruction here is loading something from memory to register. So we have a load memory to register here. Right. So we're, we're taking the value from 100R0 in the main memory, and we're putting it into register uh, R1. So that, that is very clearly this load memory to register. And so we can see instruction one is going to have to go to the instruction fetch, then the instruction decode, and then the operand fetch, right? So one, 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 and then it doesn't use these two. All right, well then we're done, right? So, so instruction one is going to do this. And we can we know that instruction one's going to do this because we're starting instruction one and it's, and it's going to finish regardless of whatever happens whatever other instructions we see instruction one's going to finish like this and and we're guaranteed this because of the way that uh, the pipeline is defined and so then we can move on to instruction two so instruction two is add r1 to r2 and that here is our is the add sub register to register which is going to be using the instruction fetch, instruction decode, and then the operation execute. Well, okay, so we have to do the instruction fetch, then the instruction decode, and the next instruction we'd have to do is the execute, the OE. Sorry, I should probably change this to OE. And I think the problem does have confusing notation where it uses EX and OE, but those are the, the same unit here. Um, so I'll 
change it there. Okay, so so now it would need to do the execution, but uh, if it would have to pass through the operator and fetch first, and then the execute, that would happen here. Uh, however, we can forward in this problem. So that means that we can actually start the execution phase here. And so it sort of skips ahead. Uh, and I'll get to an example later on in which you can skip ahead, but not immediately. And uh, we'll, we'll see that when we get to the last instruction, actually. So we can go ahead and move on to instruction three. Instruction three is storing uh, a register into memory. So store register to memory, that's right here. And that's going to be the instruction fetch, instruction decode, then operand store. So we have instruction three here, well, instruction fetch, instruction decode, and then it can jump all the way up to here to the store unit. And notice here, uh, we've got three instructions we're processing, and then one drops off because we're done. And so we're processing two instructions, then only one instruction here. Obviously, we're going to add more stuff, but we haven't broken any rules. And the order that the instructions are passing through the units hasn't also changed, right? Two is above three. And here, three is above everything else. So uh, all the other, like instruction one or instruction two doesn't appear down here. So that means we're fine. Okay, so then we have instruction four. Let's add, our, uh, add memory to register, add subtract memory to register. That's right here. So that's going to use the first four units. So that means instruction four is going to start here, and then it's going to go here, and then here, and then here. And it has to do that just in order, because it has to do one before the next. And so instruction five, we're then loading memory to register. So that's again the first one here. So that's the first three units. So then five, five, five. Then we have operation number six, which is an add memory, add subtract memory to register. So that's again the first four. So six, 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 six. And then finally we have operation number seven, which is another store register to memory. So that uses the first two units and then the last unit. So here, it would start right here. Then it would come up here and decode. And then you might think, oh, well, it doesn't have to, the, the next thing that it would do would be the store, right? However, if instruction seven were to be stored here, it would skip over operation number six. And for the purposes of this class, this is not allowed. And so what's actually going to happen with instruction seven is it's just going to sit in a buffer somewhere as you know everything's moving forward. And then once it sees the opportunity, which will be over here, it'll then jump forward. So if you, if it was just going to execute it linearly, it would uh, the store operation, the store unit would have for operation number seven would have happened here. However, at this point it can move forward. It can't jump over an instruction, uh, an, a previous instruction, but it can still jump forward once it has the room to. And so uh, this is how uh, these seven operations would be executed on this pipeline. And we can see that uh, it doesn't really finish much faster than if there was no forwarding, right? Because if there was forwarding, it would have finished here. You know, this two would have happened here and this three would have happened all the way over here. But it really, it, it is a little bit helpful. It did help save at least 100 nanoseconds. Any questions on this? No. All right, so one thing I do want to look at here is data dependencies, just to add that to this problem, uh, because it's important to understand data dependencies. So here, we're doing, we're loading this value here into register one. Then the next instruction, we're adding R1 and R2. And so that means that we need to finish loading, we, we need to finish doing this load operation before we can actually do the add. And here we can see that the actual point in time that we fetch the data from the memory, that's gonna be in the operand fetch unit. So that happens here. And then when we actually execute operation number two, it happens here. And so because they happen you know, in time and they're not trying to happen at the same time, that's fine. There isn't any sort of data dependency here. Okay, well then the next instruction here, and here I'm assuming that it's doing R1 equals R1 plus two. So this next instruction here now, well now we're reading 
from register R1. And we're going to put that value in the main, main memory. Well, in this store operation, that's going to happen right here. But we needed to finish before this actual execution happened, before we did finish doing the add, before we could do this. But if we look here, these still happen sequentially, right? And so that means that it would still be fine. And so even though these first three instructions here happen back to back, and in this pipeline, we're like squeezing them together way closer than you typically might uh, expect them to be able to execute, uh, it's still fine because in the actual units uh, that are getting executed, they're still happening sequentially. The next one, we can see that we're now uh, reading from this memory location and putting it into uh, R1, which means that we need to wait for R1 to finish getting written to before we actually override the value. But again, if you look here, operation number four, we're overwriting that value after we finish writing to R1. And so that's fine. Uh, the second one here, uh, well here you might not think there's, there's a dependency, but if you look at these two memory locations, they're the same, which means we're going to store R1 into this memory and then we're going to load it back from the, me from the memory. And so before we do this, we have to have finished this store. Well, this is happening in operation five and this load right here is happening here. And that right there, operation number three, when it does the store, it, that, that store is happening here. And so those two happen in the right order. And so that's fine. Then finally, we have read from uh, R3, uh, 300 R0 into R2. Uh, this one, this add here has to happen after we uh, finish writing to R2. So even though you know we're putting something into R2 and then we're immediately overriding R2, we're, we're actually also using it in the addition, actually, right? Because we're doing R2 equals R2 plus this. And so we do need to finish the wait for this to finish before we can actually execute. But again, if you look here at an instruction six, it got executed after this happened. And so this would be fine. And then finally, we have operation seven, which is storing R2 into uh this location in main memory. Uh, well, this location in main me memory, that's fine. We can overwrite that whenever. It has to, well, actually, it has to happen after this happens, but that happens all the way over here, so that's fine. Um, but we do need to actually uh, have the value of R2 from this unit to happen here. And that's also another reason why this seven here has to, the, the seven has to wait. Because if it happened here, well, we'd still be computing the value of R2 we are writing to memory in this execute phase. And so if we wrote R2 prematurely to this location in memory, it would have the wrong value. And so that's that's another reason we have to wait for this uh, store unit to actually execute. Any questions on that? Uh, no, thank you. All right. Well, that is number two. So we can go ahead and take a look at number three, which is the same problem, essentially, just with uh, interleaving. And so interleaving, uh, let me go ahead, I guess, let's see here. I will erase this, that, then I will move this layer up. Leave that there. Okay. Uh, so we have the same units as before. Except now we have interleaving. And interleaving has absolutely nothing to do with the pipeline. Uh, I, I want to make that very clear. Uh, interleaving has to do with how the memory works. And it affects how the pipeline runs. But it's not some different style of pipeline. It's not a different feature of the pipeline. It's specifically just um, a, a feature that the memory might have. And if it has this sort of feature, then it might restrict how the pipeline can actually function. And so uh, again, when we have the instruction fetch unit followed by the instruction decode, then the execute, or sorry, the operand fetch unit then the execute unit, and then finally the store unit. 
This one's also known as OE. And we're told in the problem that these three here use the memory. And this, this is where interleaving comes in. Uh, if you have n way interleaving, only n units can use uh, the memory at the same time. And this is, uh, this is a limitation of the memory. Really, assuming that any number of units can use the memory at the same time is unrealistic. That's not something uh, that CPUs are really capable of doing. Typically, there is a set amount of ways that the memory can interact, or the CPU can interact with the main memory. And so, uh, like by default, the simple... Uh, like a simple computer would only have one way interleaving. So only one of these units could use memory, but a more advanced one would have two way or three way or so on. And so uh, it, it acts as a limitation on how quickly things can actually happen. And so I'll go ahead and draw out another grid to start tackling the problem. Got our five units again. Instruction fetch, instruction to decode, operand fetch, execute, and store. And I'm going to assume here for the first one uh, that we have, let's say, uh, two way interleaving. And I'll just do two way, uh, the one way, if you do want to find the answer, it's in the document. So, um, but just doing two way should be give you an idea of how to approach these sorts of problem um, but just add in the same way that like the diagram in the document says there's a just a, a small asterisk next to the the units which use the memory well, that's might might be an easy way for you to remember uh, remember that and not accidentally forget which units use the memory and actually have multiple instructions using them when, when you shouldn't be. Well, actually, uh, for this, I'll, I'll just do one way because I suspect that uh, it's possible with two way that it, there's no change. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it says uh, in the document that it's the same. And I'll, I'll go actually, I'll go actually go back up there and take a look at it to show that it it, it still works with two way interleaving. Okay, so if we go back up here and take a look back at this problem here, we can see, so we want to essentially look at every timestamp and we can see, again, we have the store, the fetch unit, and then the, or the operand fetch and the instruction fetch. So here, we only have one unit, one of these three units being used at a time. Over here, we have one. Over here, we have two, right? But that's fine. Over here, only one of those is being used. Here we have two units being used. Here we have two units being used, two units being used, one unit being used, no units being used, and then one unit being used. And we can see here that at all times, it stays less than or equal to two. And so that means that this right here would have been fine on a two-way interleaving uh, CPU. And so uh, even if it was two-way interleaved, it wouldn't have mattered. You still would have gotten uh, the same performance with the one way interleaving though well i mean obviously any time that two occurs here that's going to cause a problem for a one way interleaved computer because it can't do two memory transactions at the same time and so we are going to get a different answer so let's go ahead and bring this back up here okay well hopefully this will be enough timestamps. Okay, so we have, uh, the, the, and these are all here in 100 nanoseconds time intervals. I'm just not writing 100 for obvious reasons. All 
Okay. Uh, so we have operation number one, which is a load memory to register. So that's going to go here, here, here. Uh, and so again, so we're using one unit here, we're using no units here, we're using one unit here, right, of the units that are, are going on. And this is sort of what you want to do. You want to keep track of how many things are in each unit at a time, and then just make sure you never go over one, right? And so this is good, right? I can put it here because none of these values up here, no, none of these, I'm not using more than one unit. Um, okay, so I can go on to the next one. Two, add register to register, which is the same as a load register to register. So that'll go here, here, and then in the execute stage, right? And so now at this timestamp here, I am using a unit and over here, I'm not using any, right? So far, that's still good. Then we can go on to instruction three. Instruction three is a store register to memory. So that's the first two and then the last one. Well, if I started instruction three here, then I'd be using two different units. And so I can't do that. And so what the CPU is going to have to do is insert a bubble in the pipeline. Uh, that, that's the terminology G use. And it's essentially just, you have to wait. You can't do it right now. And so we're gonna have to wait for a little bit longer and then we can start it here. And so now we're at this time, we're using one of the unit and that's fine. And then over here, we can obviously put these because uh, there's nothing here yet. So here we're using zero units. Here we're using one unit because we're using the store. Okay, then we can go ahead and start on instruction four. That's an add memory to registers. So that's this one, that's the first four units. So we can start here. That'll make it so that we're using one at this timestamp. Then it'll go over here. So here, this is not using a, uh, this is not one of the special units that uses the memory, so that's fine. That stays at one, and then it'll go up here. So that'll that'll be using the memory unit operand fetch, and then it'll finish over here, where it's not using memory. And so that's good. Then we can go on to instruction five. Instruction five is a load memory to register, right here. So that uses the first three units. Okay, well, we can't start instruction five here because it's already, it, it, one unit is already using the main memory. We can't start it here because there's already a unit using the memory. So that means we have to start instruction five all the way over here. And uh, it might seem like this would be complicated, but in reality, it, it would be fairly simple to build hardware to do this sort of check, right? You, so on this cycle right here, it basically look, okay, what which units are actively being used? Oh, the store units being used? That means I can't start something new. Okay, I'll move on. I'll just hold the instruction for now and I won't do anything. All right, the next one. Oh, this operand fetch unit is being used. Oh, I can't start anything new. So that means I'll just wait for the next cycle. This one starts. Okay, well, this one's the only unit being used, which means I can now start using the instruction fetch unit. And that's not going to cause any issues because I know no, none of the other units are using the main memory. And in reality... Uh, what's going to happen is that it'll look ahead. It'll say, okay, well, uh, I know instruction three is going to have to use these three units here. And so it can start basically planning ahead. And, and there's a bunch of algorithms and math behind what the hardware is actually doing. But for our purposes, it's fairly easy to compute uh, in our heads. So uh, instruction five will start here and then it'll move on to here. And this, in this case, right now in this, at this timestamp, we are using the main memory. So that'll go to one over here. We're not using it. And then uh, finally, when we're doing that, that fetch, when we're actually loading that data, uh, it'll, it'll be using the memory again. So then we can look at instruction six. Instruction six is an add subtract memory to register. So that's the first four units. So we can start six here uh, and we can, then it'll then move on, keep going, keep going. So here we're now using a unit. So that's fine. Here, uh, obviously, we are using unit, but nothing else is going on, so that's fine. And over here, we aren't using a memory unit, so uh, we're good on that. And then finally, we can look at instruction seven. So operation seven, let's see here. Okay, yeah. Uh, so instruction seven could start here. So instruction seven is a store memory to register. So it's the first two and then the last one. So we would start here. I can't start here because that is being used. It can't start here because it's accessing memory right here. So that means it has to start here. And it can start here because we're not using memory here. So 
that's fine. That'll go up to one. Then it'll use the next unit. Well, that's not going to use any memory. And then finally, it'll do that store, which is all the way up here, in which case it'll use the memory. And now we can see that as we've been keep tracking, keeping track of it the whole time, but every at every single point in time, we're only using maximum one unit to do a memory transaction. And uh, then we know that this is fine. And so on a one-way interleaved system, it would take 1400 nanoseconds to execute this instruction. The, or these sets of instructions. Any questions on that? Uh, no. All right, so let's see here. Let's take a look at the other ones and find a good question here. It's control units. Okay, so we'll go ahead and look at uh, number seven. And so uh, this one here, I guess we're assuming the same sorts of instructions here. So I will just move this up. However, we're going to look at a different set of instructions here. And I will write those out just manually. Uh, okay. So the instructions we're going to look at are load R1, 100, R0. Then finally we have add R1, R2, R1. So here we're doing a slightly different syntax. So I'm assuming it's adding these two and storing in that one. Then we have store 100 R0 R1. Then we have store 200 R0 R3. And then finally add R3 R2 and then 200 R0. Okay. So the first task here uh, for this problem is just to find the data dependencies hazards. Uh, so you want to look at the instructions and just say, okay, well, which of these instructions depend on what other instructions? And so I'll go ahead and, and write, label these. So which instruction they are. And we can start looking at the dependencies. So obviously instruction one has no dependencies because there's no instructions preceding it. So we're good with that. But we can go ahead and start on instruction two. So what instruction two is going to do is it's going to take the value of register R1, add it to the value of register R2, and then store that result in R1. However, in the previous instruction, we're going to put something in, we're going to load some data into R1. And, you know, assuming just a non-pipeline CPU, this instruction would fully finish before this next one started, which means this R1 value is it's expecting to get filled at this instruction. And so we have a de dependency that two depends on one. So instruction two here depends on instruction one to finish. All right, so then it, there's no more instructions you could possibly have a dependency on. So that means uh, that's all the dependencies for two. Then we can look at instruction three and we see, okay, well, what we're doing is first, well, we're loading R1 now, we're storing R1, the value of R1, into the main memory. Well, here on instruction two, we're computing R1 somehow. And we have to make sure that uh, this value actually gets stored before we try to write it into the memory. And so instruction three here has a dependency on two, which in turn has a dependency on one. Right, so so it, at the same time, three has a dependency on one, but there's usually no reason to point it out because that's it's it's transitive. Uh, another thing to note here is that even if this was R two, for for instance, right? Well, then in that case, there wouldn't be a dependency for instruction two, but there would still be a dependency on instruction one. 
The reason is because here I'm taking from this memory location and putting it into the register. Here I'm storing something into that memory location. So that means this load here has to happen before the store can happen. Uh, if they execute in a different order or like one unit or something of it gets executed in the wrong order, well then suddenly you're going to be loading the value of R2 into R1 here instead of whatever is actually in the memory location. So uh, in that case, there is also a dependency between this memory location and this memory location. And that's typically how it works, is if you're trying to put something into a register, and at some other point in time, you're trying to read from that register, they you need to make sure that those things happen in the right order. And the same goes for memory. So if memory is being written to and accessed, you need to make sure those happen in the right order. Um, and it's it's possible to have read write dependencies, so that that where you'll read a value and then write to that value, like this, like these two instructions here, where I'm reading from 100 R0 and then uh, writing to 100 R0. Uh, but you also have cases where uh, you're writing to R1 and then immediately need to read it. So though both of those are cases that you need to consider. Um, but here in this case. Since three depends on two and two already depends on one, I'll just write this dependency, this dependency like this. Instruction four has absolutely no dependencies, uh, right? Because we're using register R3, which we've not used previously, and we're using memory location 200 R0, which hasn't been used previously. So that's fine, right? We're, we're not going to somehow, uh, like we're, we're, there's no, we're not depending on some other instruction to finish. So instruction four has no dependencies. Instruction five uh, might have a couple of dependencies, so we, we just got to take a look. So here we're trying to add this uh, this memory location to R two and then store that in R three. Okay. Well, instruction five has uh, two dependencies to instruction four, right? So here we're trying to access the value uh, in memory at this location, but in the previous instruction, this is where we're writing that value. Right, so this is where we're actually going to put this value into the right spot in memory, and then we're subsequently going to read it again. You know, it's often best not to question what's actually going on in these because obviously this doesn't make much sense. A more efficient thing to do would just be to use R three or something like that. You know, not reread it again. However, uh, we we'll just ignore that, and it's obviously for educational purposes. So, uh. Well, we have to read here, so five is going to depend on instruction four, but also we're writing to R3, and here we're reading from R3. So we have like this dependency where we need to make sure we write to this memory location before we read from it, but we also need to make sure that we read R3 in this instruction before we write to R3 in this instruction. Uh, and, and sometimes some of these are, it's, it's being a little overcautious, uh, but given that these problems can be very dynamic and you might not necessarily know exactly what, uh, you might not know exactly the, the pipeline might be different for a specific problem, in which case those might be a problem. Uh, just, it's good to get practice with actually being able to notice all of the possible hazards that might occur. And so, uh, but in the, in any case, five depends on four executing properly before it can actually do anything. So we're good with that. We can just leave it at that. Um, and so I will go ahead and move this over here. So we can just keep track. Two depends on one, three depends on two, and five depends on four, uh, so that we can keep that in mind when we're actually working it out. Uh, but then we can actually just go ahead and uh, start with uh, looking at what these instructions are doing. And let me just take a quick look here. Uh, it's using the same units. And uh, the one thing the problem states is that suppose that hazards are recognized at the input in the pipeline. Um, and that is typically how it does work in hardware. Uh, the, it'll look at the instruction. It'll look at all the instructions currently being executed and say, would it cause a problem if I started this instruction now? Uh, and it's not only going to look at the units that are currently getting executed, it's going to look at what's scheduled to get executed as, as well. And again, that might seem complicated, but uh, that that is what they do. So uh, 
that is something that you can sort of that, that you can look ahead. So so as I was doing with the last example where I filled out all of what's happening with instruction one, that's essentially what the memories the, the CPU is actually going to see. It sees that instruction one is going to use those three units at those three times. And so it's not going to schedule something that would cause a conflict. Uh, that, that would actually cause a conflict there. Um, so let me see here. Two -way memory. Okay, and so we're assuming uh, a two-way memory interleave. That is going behind there. Let's go ahead and okay, there we go. Um, and let's see. So we have again just the these standard units. It's basically this same situation here. Uh, let's see. So instruction fetch. Instruction decode. Operand fetch. Uh, execute. And then store. And yeah, so so you can. It's also maybe obvious, but you can assume that the pipeline, like the CPU, knows what its own pipeline is. So it's going to be perfect at being able to 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 know when things can get scheduled and when they can't get scheduled. So uh, you can like it, if a. Uh, if it's feasible to look ahead and understand that, oh yeah, it'd be fine if this, this instruction goes here, the CPU is gonna be able to do that as well. So uh, you don't have to like try to dumb down your thinking in terms of trying to figure out where things are, how things are gonna work. Uh, the CPU is gonna be really, really smart about it. And so, yeah, I think also with this problem, it's also just assuming 100 nanoseconds for everything. And again, that's just to help you focus on the hazards portion of it. All right. Hopefully that will be enough. Okay. So we've got instruction one here. So it's a load memory to register. So we can see here that it'll use the first three units. And so, and it doesn't have any dependencies, so we can just put it, we can just schedule it. Right. So we've already looked and figured out that these hazard, hazards occur. And again, the CPU would have done that as well. It would have looked at these and said, okay, well, these are the hazards. And so it knows it can just schedule one immediately. No problem. Okay. So problem two, it's quite, uh, uh, instruction number two, it does depend on instruction number one. And so it, it just tells us that we have to be careful with how operation two is getting executed. So uh, operation two is an add register to register. So it's, it's sort of like the load register to register. So to use the first two units and then the execute unit. And so the dependency that occurs here is that we need to make sure that the load occurs before the execute occurs. So we need to make sure that this right here, this fetch right here, this is where the load is actually gonna happen. This needs to happen before the execute of instruction two, right? So if we started executing instruction two, it would go here, it would fetch it, then it would decode it, and then the execute would go up here. And here we're assuming forwarding as well. Uh, so here we can notice because, because two happens after one, well, specifically the execute portion of instruction two happens after the operand fetch portion of operation one, that there is no problem with doing this. It's fine. The order, it'll be able to execute those two without causing any issues. Okay, so then we can move on to ex number three. And number three here does depend on number two. And it also coincidentally depends on uh, number one, just because it needs to make sure this read happens. But uh, this right here is going to overwrite R, which happens here, right? So uh, we know that the dependency is really on this unit here. And so since we're trying to store here, we need to make sure that the store phase, the the the, op, the, the store unit of instruction three happens after the execute unit of operation number two, right? That's actually the dependency going on. We want this value of R1, which happens at the execute unit. So uh, if we just consider, okay, well, what happens if we start instruction three immediately, right? So it'll get fetched. And here, again, we're looking at interleaving. So we can start it here because we're, we're now using two units. 
two memory units, but uh, that's fine because we're using a two-way interleave, so that means we can use two different units. Uh, then it would get the decoded here, and then finally it would get stored up here, right? Because this is a, a store registered to memory, and that's using the first two and the last one. And so that dependency, again, was that this store right here needs to happen after the execute, and it does. So that's fine. That doesn't cause any issues. Um, and so we can move on. Instruction number four has no dependencies, right? And instruction number four is a store uh, registered to memory again. And so it uses the first two and the last one. And so we don't have to look at anything when we're doing this. We, we can just say it happens. Uh, well, that, that's a little bit of a lie. Uh, you don't have to look at dependencies, but you do have to look still at the interleaving. So here we're still, we're using only one unit of memory. We're only using one memory unit and we're only using one memory unit. So that's fine. That's not going to cause an issue. And so then we can move on to instruction five and instruction five has a dependency on instruction four. Um, so it, we have two dependencies here. We have for, and I'll write this out because I might get a little bit, might, might be easier to see. So let's see here. We have to, whenever we read this, we need to make sure that this write happened before. So for instruction, so the, let's see here, how am I going to write this? The operation, uh, operand fetch of five has to happen after the store of four, right? So whenever we fetch this, that has to happen after we've stored this. There's no way to get around that. Okay. We also have that we, when we execute this operation, it has to happen after the store of this. So the execute of five has to happen after the store of four as well, right? Well, obviously the execute is going to happen after the fetch. So this dependency doesn't really matter, but as long as this happens here, we're good. Right, so we can go ahead and try to execute operation five. So a five is an add, subtract memory to register. So it's gonna use the first uh, four units. So it'll start here, then it'll get decoded. And again, it can start here because uh, it, 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 although it is using two memory units, it's two way interleaved, so that's fine. Uh, then it would go ahead and fetch here. And we can notice here that this fetch for five, the operand fetch for five happens after the store for four. And so that's fine. The, the dependency, uh, the dependencies are satisfied and everything is done in the right order. And so then five can go ahead and fi finish executing here. And again, this also has a dependency on this one, but it happens after this one anyway. So we knew that it would not cause a problem. And so uh, it turns out that, you know, everything just gets executed sequentially. That right? just back to back to back to back. Even though there's dependencies, it's still possible that the, those dependencies don't ultimately matter. Um, but it is possible in some scenarios for those dependencies to actually matter. Uh, any questions on this? Uh, no, thank you. Everything is clear. All right. And the last problem is just about interleaving, so, uh, which I've already talked about. So uh, any questions on and Any other questions? Uh, no, I guess I'm, I'm good with it. Uh, Let's see. Actually, it should probably. I, I I will look at number eight because, uh, it is. Um, I I can point out inter like problems with interleaving a bit better. Uh, so here we're just gonna assume we have the same five stage pipeline, with the same. Uh, units that all you know use the memory in the same way. And this is, this is going to be a pattern for this class. We're not going to talk about too many crazy pipelines. Uh, and so uh, this one is a really common, this five stage pipeline. This is, this is known as the, the risk pipeline, uh, the, the five stage risk pipeline. Um, don't, don't need to know that, but fun fact. And uh, it's one that's I think commonly used. And as you can see how the data dependencies don't really matter. That's sort of one reason why this is a good pipeline is because it avoids the majority of all data dependency hazards. Uh, it, it, they still happen, 
However, the way that these units are ordered and precisely what they are doing uh, typically makes it so that it, it doesn't really matter. And so here we're just going to assume that we're going to execute uh, six instructions. Uh, each instruction is going to have to use all of the units. Um, and everything just takes the same amount of time. So we're just assuming a super basic model for what the actual program is. But it's going to be uh, one way interleaved. i got to get a bit of room here because this is going to take some time. Typically, the lower the amount of interleaving, so like one-way interleaving, the longer it'll take to do things because you have to introduce bubbles in the pipeline, and that just essentially makes it take more and more time. So I'll we'll start with this, and hopefully that goes. So we'll start instruction one, and that'll just use all the units. That's fine. And so let me move this slightly. So we're assuming one way here. Right, so instruction one will just get scheduled here, and that's fine. Then instruction two will start. Well, uh, well, we're using a memory unit here. We're not using one here. We're using one here. We're not using one here and here. If we start two here, we then will use one here. It won't. We won't use one here. We will use one here. Oh, that looks a bit too much like a one. And then it'll go here, and then finally here, where it'll also use a, a unit, right? And so we can execute one and then two immediately after. But now we have that each at each of these points in time, we're using a memory unit, which means we can't actually start instruction three till all the way over here. And three would at this point, nothing's get nothing's in the schedule uh, for getting executed, so three would just get scheduled. And then you know you'd have the same exact thing. These would all use one, and then you'd start four, and you say, okay, well it it fits right afterwards. But then again, you have that you're using memory every single time, and so uh, it just completely locks up the pipeline. And so if, well we have two more instructions, five and six to execute. So if I would go ahead and start here and it would just get scheduled normally, same thing, six would, you would see that, oh, it kind of just fits right in the holes and then you'd finally be done. And although you are pipelining, uh, you do see that it does take a bit longer, so, right? It takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 18. So 1800 nanoseconds for this whole thing to finish. Well, whereas if we had a two-way interleaving, then, you know, all this circumstance where we're completely saturating uh, all the memory, but the, the memory bus, and we can no longer uh, really do anything else with the memory, well, now we can do two, th two different things with the memory. And so that, that will significantly increase uh, the ability for us to actually execute in more instructions faster. So we have again the IF, uh, ID, OF, EX, ST. And then I'll go ahead and draw out a grid. Thankfully this one will be smaller because we can do more things simultaneously. So here we have a two-way interleaving. All right, so instruction one would start. So it'd just go here, 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 here. And then two would start. Let me move it down a little bit. So now we're using, we're using memory here, here, and here. Then two can immediately start here. That's fine, no problem. So then we'd be using memory here, here, and here. Well, we still haven't reached the cap of two. So then three can start here, 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 and here. So now this now is using two memory units. This one's using two. And this last one over here is using two. So we're still good. So we can go ahead and start four. And we can see that four can actually fit right here. And in this case, now we're using two units, two units, two units, two units. So we can see we can no longer start fetching a new instruction in, at any of these points in time. 
so we have to wait for five all the way over here. But we can do five and then six we can do immediately afterwards. Again, same reason that we can do it back to back up here. Um, we're, we'll be doing less, but now it'll take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So now it'll only take 1400 nanoseconds. So we, we are saving time by being able to f squeeze these two sections together. And if you did three way, well, there's only three units using memory. So we can use all of them, which means we can just do in all the instructions back to back to back. No problem. Any questions on this? Uh, actually, a quick question, Jacob. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when you were, you say you skipped uh, the five as well, but there's only one unit used at that last four. Can we actually start from there? Actually, you can. Uh, and in fact, actually, you can start. Uh, yeah, that is my bad. Um, you can start much earlier here. Let me go ahead and back this up. So, yeah, so here. There's a, there is only one unit being used, and there's only uh, one being, unit being used here as well. I think, let me look at the, okay, no, yeah, the, the sheet online does do that. Okay, All right, so yeah, so five can actually start right here, right, because now there's two units. So five, 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 five. And then six can start here. Again, because if you count the units, we have two, and then we have two here. Then we only have one, but we have no more instructions that we need to do. So we can do that. So we're now up to two here, two here, two here. Um, and so now the total is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hundred nanoseconds. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. T typically, you can notice here that the the sort of bubble we have two sort of time that we have a bubble of like length two that kind of propagates through the pipeline. Whereas here we have a bubble of length four that propagates through the pipeline. And that's also something that typically happens uh, when you increase the amount of interleaving is the size of the bubble decreases. But yeah, thank, thanks for catching that. I just completely blanked on that there. <laughs> no problem. Oh yeah, any other questions? Uh, not really. Like when you, when you actually now, um differentiate between the dependencies and these kind of interlivings like I can see that it the instructions usually start before uh, you know even waiting for the other instruction to end mm -hmm. so I guess that's one of the significant differences that makes a huge time difference yeah yeah but uh yeah one one thing also just to, to note about pipelining is that uh, it's 100% used in essentially every single CPU that has been made since like the eight, late 80s, maybe. I, I, I don't have a, an exact time to put it, but uh, pipelining has been used for a long time, uh, along with some other technologies to speed up CPUs. So uh, really, really basic pipelines, obviously, and nowadays the pipelines are insane. Um, but if you're using a computer, you can assume that it has a pipeline in it, uh, because that speeds up th uh, speeds up the execution of programs uh, a ridiculous amount, typically. But yeah, uh, I think that is good for the video.